Good morning, family. It's wonderful to see everybody today. If you will, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that you've given us, that we are able to come together, Lord, as your family. We just ask that those of us who aren't with us, like Brother Dan, who is recovering, may you just place a hand of healing upon him, Lord, and a hand of comfort. Let him know that he is not alone, that you are always with him, and we as your family are there for him as well. May you get better quickly and join us again. Lord, we just ask as we look into your words today that you guide us in what we ourselves can learn to be more like you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. These past Sundays, we've been looking at the five solas. These are foundational doctrines and core beliefs that are essential truths of God that reveal the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, my hope is that when we read these core truths, that you not only hear the importance and the meaning of them separately, but that you gain an understanding of how the five solas, as well as the rest of Scripture, work together in harmony. There is never a time when the Bible ever contradicts itself. Instead, it explains itself, and it reassures us that what is stated is God-breathed. Now, we started with sola scriptura, God's word alone. The sola maintains that the Bible is the highest source of authority in the Christian's life. That is what we should be holding on to as the authority in our lives, not what we think or how we feel. Today, feelings run rampant, and everybody seems to think that their feelings matter more than anybody else's. The Bible is the authority from which we are to gain perspective and gauge our actions. The next we looked at was sola fide, faith alone. And that affirms your justification, meaning made right, being made right in God's eyes comes by faith. Not just any faith, but faith in Jesus Christ. We then looked at sola gratia, grace alone. This sola, where it is confusing, says that sinners are saved as an unearned gift of God's grace, not as a result of works, lest any of us should boast. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. When we are saved, it is through God's grace as a gift that we haven't earned. Today, we'll focus on solus Christus, Salvation is found in Christ alone. There are some groups that try to say that it's Christ plus works. Others believe that it's Christ plus his mama. They say that Mary also has the same significance as Christ. This is blasphemy. It's wrong. Solus Christus expresses the Bible's conviction that there is one, one mediator between God and men. That mediator being Jesus Christ. Therefore, there is salvation in no one else. No other thing can bring us to the Lord regardless of what some man in a funny hat wants to say. Not all roads lead to God, only Christ. Today we'll be in Hebrews chapter 10. We'll be looking at verses 8 through 14. These are not foreign verses. We've looked at them before. Our verses point out that God's own word promises to replace a system centered on the priests, the temples, and their rites, their traditions, and yes, even sacrifices. Those flawed earthly components were symbols of the real solution to sin, which is a one-time sacrifice made by Jesus Christ. In Acts 4.12, it says, Nor is there salvation in any other, 
For there is no other name under heaven given among men which we must be saved. There is no other route to salvation except Jesus Christ. Peter is declaring that salvation is only found through Jesus and that there is no other name. Now he says no other name, which is important because there are many people who try to claim that Jesus is not the only way. They're wrong. Turn with me, if you haven't already, to Hebrews chapter 10. We'll be starting at verse 8, reading through 14. 10 8 says, Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings, and offerings for sin, thou wouldst not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which we will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. I want to go over these verses. We're going to start, of course, with verse 8. The purpose of the passage in Hebrews is to show that animal sacrifices the Jews were making cannot solve the problem of human sin. They're temporary solutions to an eternal issue. And they can only cover external and ceremonial concerns. They can't truly change who a man is. God did not intend for those animal sacrifices to be a permanent solution. Quoting the book of Jeremiah, Hebrews states in verses 6 through 9, it talks about God's permanent solution with a new covenant facilitated by Jesus Christ. It says, but now he, being Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which has established on better promises. For if that covenant, and I want to point out the if, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the days when I took them out of the hands to lead them out of the hand, land of Egypt, because they did not continue my covenant, I disregarded them, or discarded them, says the Lord. God is clear. The new covenant is his solution to atone for man's sins. Jesus is seen as the mediator of this new covenant. As his death on the cross is considered the sacrifice that enabled us to have a new relationship with God. When we go back to our text verses, looking at verse 9 through 11, using 8 as the information for the next verses, because context matters, verse 8 indicated that God was not ultimately interested in sacrifices, not the sacrifices of the animals, his desire was for his will to be done, indicating that the use of the body that was given to Christ was the real fulfillment for God's will. 
God had always intended for the new covenant to come. The old covenant sacrifices then were only meant to be symbols. They were supposed to be indicators of what was to come for the real resolution of our sins, which came through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus' sacrifice obtains what animal blood could never, ever obtain. That is our salvation. Jesus was sacrificed once for all. Now, some people read that and they automatically put in another word. Because the, the term we're used to is once and for all. But if you read it, it says once for all. Sacrifice made one time for everybody in the world is what that means. If animal sacrifices could have obtained that salvation for all, there would have been no need to repeat them. Yet we know, because the Bible tells us, the priests would continuously offer the same sacrifices daily. Verses 12 and 13 first confirms Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. Then it repeats images applied to Christ in earlier verses where he was previously described as seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. That was in Hebrews 1. Saying, from that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstools. That is a quote from Psalm 110, verse 1, which announces the Messiah's reign. It says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Till I make your enemies your footstool. Now verse 14 of our text explains. For by one offering he has perfected forever. Those who are being sanctified. Christ offered his signal sacrifice. Now I want to make sure that I point this out. And I want to be clear. What happened to Jesus on the cross. Was God's will. He wasn't murdered. He wasn't taken. Christ gave himself freely for us. He sacrificed himself for us. And once that sacrifice was done, he sat down, which symbolized his work was complete. Now in John 19, verses 28 through 30, it references this by telling us, while he was on the cross... After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Knowing that all things were accomplished. Everything that he came to do. All the prophecies that he came to fulfill. Had been done. Jesus proclaimed it is finished. And surrendered, surrendered his mortal life. To wash away our sins. So we may be made acceptable in God's eyes. That is the greatest sacrifice ever made for any of us. Sola Christos, Christ alone, is the fulfillment of Scripture. Sola Christos, Christ alone, there is salvation in no one else but Christ. In Romans 3, 21 and 22, it says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. God's righteousness has now been made manifest or made known, if you will, apart from the law, meaning it's new. It's not part of the law. It's separate from it. It's replacing it. There is a path to righteousness, a path to God's righteousness, which does not require us to keep the old covenant, to keep the old laws. 
Now, Paul adds, the law and the prophets have been pointing to God's righteousness all along. If you look through the Old Testament, the prophets are talking about Jesus is coming, the Messiah. It's pointing to God's righteousness all along. In fact, it was always God's plan to come to the point where Jesus' sacrifice was done as a way for human beings to be saved. That was all part of God's will and his plan. Paul sums up very clearly that the righteousness of God is available to humans through faith in Jesus Christ for all to believe, for all who believe. Sola Cristo, Christ alone. As Spurgeon would preach, if you put your faith in anyone else or anything else, you don't have faith. That's not faith. And if you only put a portion of your faith or you separate your faith and split it between Christ and anything else, Christ and works, Christ and his mother Mary, if you split that faith, then that is not saving faith. That is not faith that will give you access to God's grace. That is incomplete faith that will not save you from eternal damnation. It's not enough to say, I believe Christ died for my sins, but I believe I got to say a hundred Hail Marys and I got to venerate Mary because she's very important. Mary has not heard a single prayer since she passed. And that is a fact. Your faith must be in Christ alone. Finally, I want to look at Verses that I hope everyone is familiar with. I'm sure there's at least one that's going to stand out to you when I read it. John 3, 13 through 18. 13 says, No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man, who is in heaven. So if anyone tries to convince you that they've visited heaven, that they've sat and ate lunch at the Sky Lounge, that they've ridden down a volcano with Jesus. They're liars. They're delusional. That's not true. We just read in Scripture, no one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven. That is the Son of Man who is in heaven. 14 says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the, in the name of the only begotten Son of God. What's being said here is that no person has ever gone to heaven and returned. The only person on earth who ever did that was Christ himself. The term Son of Man I want, to, I want to explain a little bit here. The Son of Man is a name that Jesus often used for himself. He will refer to himself using this title several times in the Gospels. This name refers to an Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah found in the book of Daniel in chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, if you want to look that up. When Jesus spoke of Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness, it was meant to foreshadow the sacrifice Christ was going to be making when he was lifted up on the cross. Now some people may wonder, how does a snake on a staff have anything to do with the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior? And I'll explain briefly. You see, 
Israel was attacked by poisonous snakes due to their disobedience. The people went to Moses for help. Moses consulted God, and God instructed Moses to make an image of a snake and mount it on a pole. Anyone who looked at the snake who had been bitten was cured from their bite, and they lived. This can be found in the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 6 through 9, if you wanted to look it up. I would recommend it. It's by reading. Just as those who were bitten had to trust in God and have faith that the image of the snake would heal them because it is God's will, Christ alone is who we must look to in faith in order for us to be saved. I want to be clear. Faith in Christ is not a work. It's not something that we just do. We must believe. We see in verses 15, 16, and 18 of what I just read, the word believe is used. We must believe that Christ alone is the way, the truth, and the light, and that no one comes to the Father except through Him. We must believe God did not send His Son into the world to condemn it, but that the world through Him might be saved. Sola Christos, in Christ alone, is our salvation. And as I have Brother Bill join me, I want to leave you with John's explanation for why he wrote his gospel. John 20, 31 says this. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. In Christ alone, we have our faith. In Christ alone, we have our salvation. waiting for you. Oh, gracious Father, this message today, may it touch many hearts. May their eyes be opened to your word that it's Christ alone. There is no other way to heaven but through Jesus. Thank you for setting him, sending him Thank you for your sacrifice, Jesus, that we may have eternal and peace with you. Ask you now, Father, to just send your blessings down, and we thank you for this day that you've given us, and ask for your peace and your guidance through this coming week. In Jesus' name, amen.